I probably tried my best when I was younger to not to be a dairy farmer. I went to university, if you can call it that, for a good solid two weeks. Ten days, ten days. <laughs> and um, very quickly realised it wasn't for me. I'm the fourth generation on that farm and the business, we, we tenanted that farm before we bought it. It's like the business has been running for nearly a hundred years. We were trying to meet what was deemed to be the industry top 25% in terms of performance. And we got there fairly rapidly, it, took, it was about a three year process and um, so we hit all the parameters and it was very high cost. So you can imagine when you've got high cost and low margin, there's not a lot of room for error. The rewards that we were getting were just, it wasn't enough, it wasn't sustainable. And you, you could almost feel like it was that house of cards where if something didn't quite work, it just, everything just started trickling down. And my brother gave a, f a throwaway comment and he says, oh, I don't know why we can't just feed them. Why can't we just feed them silage? It started niggling with me and then I did a little bit of research and then I happened upon this, this consultant. I'd already realised what I needed to do. So when I wrote an email to him, my email subject was how to get cows to eat grass. 2013, the end of March, we sent a whole load of Holstein cows out to graze for the first time. We were going to offer the cows a nutritionally rich source of feed I like grew on our farm anyway. My passion has moved from feeding cows and, and, and moving the cows to being probably my, my personality of result driven. Now I'm all about the grass. And it's just so much better for my bottom line because I'm not having to put the inputs onto it, the fertilizer, because actually Mother Nature's doing what she does best but we're just allowing it, like I said, to express itself. Having the headspace, it did get me thinking about where does my milk end up? I didn't have that sort of connection with either the, the milk and then the end product or, or even the customer or the client. That connection wasn't there. So I approached First Milk and actually we, we, doing what we'd been doing for the previous 10 years, we'd uh, ticked a lot of the boxes already. And then there was discussions about Nestle, because Dalston, and we're so close to the factory in Dalston, you can literally stand in our, one of our fields and it's just there and it keeps things as, as local as it can be in terms of how far the milk's moving. We were doing a lot of what was already on the milk plan already, but we have gone further again because we didn't have that guidance beforehand and now with the milk plan we almost have this this guide of it's not how we could be farming but it's like it's why we should be farming. Nestle were saying you can have all of that but also there's this other benefit of capturing carbon like Nestle are wanting to achieve a deeper root structure so we can sequester carbon into the ground. I'd never talked about carbon before. There's a lot of grass on the farm at any point. There's lots of ground cover, so there's lots of birds, there's lots of uh, hares. I've seen an increase in hares on the farm, and this is helping the environment and the wildlife from a wider point of view. In a lower, a lower stress situation where you've got all your bases are covered and everything's comfortable, I have much more headroom to think about many other things. I've got a great milk contract, a great partner in Nestle, and actually, I can grow my business to suit my family, even if they don't want to farm in it. Mm -hmm.